Well, as Director of National Intelligence, uh, I would like the American people to know that the intelligence community and all of its agencies uh, are postured to identify threats of all kinds against the United States. The President has specifically directed us to make the matter of the election meddling and securing our election process a top priority, and we have done that and are doing that and will continue to do so. We have incorporated the lessons learned from the 2016 election and implemented a broad spectrum of actions to share more information across the federal government, as well as with state and local governments and also with the public and the private sector. The intelligence community continues to be concerned about the threats of upcoming U.S. elections, both the midterms and the presidential elections of 2020. In regards to Russian involvement in the midterm elections, we continue to see a pervasive messaging, messaging campaign by Russia to try to weaken and divide the United States. These efforts are not exclusive to this election or future elections, but certainly cover issues relevant to the election. We also know the Russians try to hack into and steal information from candidates and government officials alike. We are aware that Russia is not the only country that has an interest in trying to influence our domestic political environment. We know there are others that who have the capability and may be considering influence activities. As such, we will continue to monitor and warn of any such efforts. I am committed to making sure that the intelligence community is working together in integrating across organizations and missions and seeking greater transparency with the public. The ODNI has instituted a broad spectrum of actions covering collection, analysis, reporting, education, and partnerships all designed to provide the best threat assessments to federal, state, and local officials, as well as to the public and private sector when necessary. For example, my office leads the interagency working group now meeting weekly as a push towards November with Department of Justice, FBI, Department of Homeland Security, CIA, and NSA, inclusive of regional cyber and counterintelligence experts all focused on ensuring election security and integration of our efforts. The intelligence community's focus right now is persistent support to the FBI, to the Department of Homeland Security, and other agencies in their election responsibilities, and my office is ensuring these organizations receive timely and proactive intelligence community support. Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. I want to start by briefly mentioning that on Tuesday, DHS hosted the first National Cybersecurity Summit. This brought together government, industry leaders, and academia to discuss opportunities to join forces to counter threats to our nation's critical infrastructure. I want to thank all of those who joined us from academia, government, and the private sector, all who participated, and those who signed up to concrete actions to confront cybersecurity challenges. Across every critical infrastructure sector, from energy to financial services to transportation to communication and so many others, a single attack can have widespread and cascading consequences. I look forward to working with the nation's leading minds in the digital realm as we stand up the National Risk Management Center. But it's not just risk to our prosperity, privacy, and infrastructure we have to worry about, and that's why we're here today. Our democracy itself is in the crosshairs. Free and fair elections are the cornerstone of our democracy, and it has become clear that they are the target of our adversaries who seek, as the DNI just said, to sow discord and undermine our way of life. I fully share the intelligence community and the ODNI's assessments, past efforts, uh, past efforts and those uh, today to interfere with our election and of the current threat. 
Our adversaries have shown they have the willingness and capability to interfere in our elections. DHS has and continues to work closely with state and local ele election officials throughout the country by offering a range of services to help identify weaknesses in their election systems. Whether it's offering no-cost voluntary technical assistance or sharing best practices for securing online voter registration databases or providing technical advice on ransomware and destructive malware, our department stands ready to provide tailored support based on each jurisdiction's unique needs. This is yet another example where one size does not fit all. I am pleased to inform you that to date, all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and over 900 local governments have partnered with DHS in order to bolster the resilience of the nation's election infrastructure. Various states also have organic capabilities and are engaging with the private sector and academia to improve the security of elections. Election infrastructure is not a destination. It requires aggressive and ongoing vigilance. Everyone must play their role to ensure that every vote is counted and is counted correctly. All of us up here today, members of Congress, state and local election officials, and the public. As all of us up here today gain new insights into potential adversaries and campaigns, we are committed to providing our partners with the government's best intelligence and information available. The progress we have made is real and the nation's elections are more resilient today because of the work we are all doing but we must continue to ensure that our democracy is protected. Thank you for being here, and I'll turn it over to Director Ray. Afternoon, everybody. Last fall, after I, shortly after I became director, I stood up a new foreign influence task force at the FBI, which was designed to identify and counteract the full range of malign foreign influence operations targeting our democratic institutions and our values. The task force now brings together across the waterfront of FBI expertise, so we're talking counterintelligence, cyber, criminal, and even counterterrorism designed to root out and respond to foreign influence operations. For their part, our adversaries' influence operations have encompassed a wide range of activities. So just like we have a multidisciplinary response, that's because the threat is multidisciplinary. So just a few examples of some of the things we've seen over the past. Targeting U.S. officials and other U.S. persons through traditional intelligence tradecraft, criminal efforts to suppress voting and provide illegal campaign financing, cyber attacks against voting infrastructure along with computer intrusions targeting elected officials and others, and a whole slew of other kinds of influence, like both overtly and covertly manipulating news stories, spreading disinformation, leveraging economic resources, and escalating divisive issues. But it's important to understand this is not just an election cycle threat. Our adversaries are trying to undermine our country on a persistent and regular basis, whether it's election season or not. There's a clear distinction between, on the one hand, activities that threaten the security and integrity of our election systems, and on the other hand, the broader threat of influence operations designed to manipulate and influence our voters and their opinions. With our partners, we're trying to counteract both threats. We have three pillars to our operational strategy. The first pillar is our investigations and our operations. And for a variety of reasons, which I hope are obvious, and including operational sensitivities, I'm not going to be able to describe the full extent of those efforts. But I will tell you that our Foreign Influence Task Force works with FBI personnel in all 56 FBI field offices. And even as we speak, We've got open investigations with a foreign influence nexus spanning field offices, FBI field offices across the country. So make no mistake, the scope of this foreign influence threat is both broad and deep. Second pillar, I said there were three pillars. The second is focused on information sharing and intelligence sharing. We're working closely with our partners in the intelligence community and in the federal government, as well as with our state and local partners to establish a common operating picture. Just last week, as an example, we disseminated a list to our state and local law enforcement partners of 
various foreign influence indicators for them to be on the lookout for, things like malicious cyber activity, social abnormalities, and foreign propaganda activities. The idea is to marshal additional eyes and ears in the fight. We're also working with our international partners to exchange intelligence and strategies for combating the threat, because this is, after all, a shared threat with our allies. The third pillar of our approach is based on our strong relationships with the private sector. Technology companies have a frontline responsibility to secure their own networks, products, and platforms. But we're doing our part by providing actionable intelligence to better enable them to address abuse of their platforms by foreign actors. So this year we've met with top social media companies and technology companies several times. We've given them classified briefings, we've shared specific threat indicators and account information and a variety of other pieces of information so that they can better monitor their own platforms. The reality is it's going to take all of us working together to hold the field because this threat is not going away. As I have said consistently, Russia attempted to interfere with the last election and continues to engage in malign influence operations to this day. This is a threat we need to take extremely seriously and to tackle and respond to with fierce determination and focus. And together with our partners, both those here and some of the other partners we've talked about, I'm confident that we can protect the integrity of our democratic institutions and maintain public confidence in our electoral process. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I appreciate the leadership and support from the President, the Secretary of Defense, the Director of National Intelligence. I believe our mandate is clear. As part of its mission to defend the nation, the Department of Defense is providing intelligence, information support, and technical expertise to the Department of Homeland Security for use by state and local officials to prevent foreign interference in our elections. This is a vital mission for us and the nation. It draws on our deep experience and expertise in continuing work in this area. Our support has been ongoing and will continue through the midterm elections. We are also providing intelligence and information leads to the Federal Bureau of Investigation on foreign adversaries who are attempting to sow discord and division within the American public. This information is shared with appropriate entities to alert them of malicious cyber actors. U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency are tracking a wide range of foreign cyber adversaries and are prepared to conduct operations against those actors attempting to undermine our nation's midterm elections. These type of operations are sensitive and require confidentiality for success. I won't discuss the specifics except to state that our forces are well trained ready, and very capable. I have complete confidence in the forces under my command. We will work in conjunction with other elements of our government to ensure we bring the full power of our nation to bear on any foreign power that attempts to interfere in our democratic processes. I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you. Uh, as I said at the beginning, if we could stay on topic and also if you could, when asking a question, direct it to a specific person. And as always, after uh, we finish this part of the briefing, I'll be back to answer other questions on news of the day. Sure. John, go ahead. Sir, uh, uh, Director Coates, if I could uh, direct a question to you. Sure. Uh, let me take you back, if I could, to uh, Helsinki. The President seemed to indicate that he may believe Vladimir Putin when he says he doesn't didn't have any influence uh, in the uh, 2016 election. What, what is your belief about the Russian government involvement in meddling in 2016? And if, as you say, Russia continues to try to influence our electoral process, does that mean that nothing much came of the meeting with Putin, or is it other than government actors who were involved? Well, in relationship to the uh, 2016 election, of course, none of us were in office at that particular time, but both the president, the vice president, I think everyone on this stage has acknowledged the fact that the ICA was a correct assessment of what happened in 2016. 
we have subsequently made the determination to make this a top priority, that it doesn't happen again, and we're throwing everything at it, and we, we will have and we'll be discussing that here uh, today. Relative to uh, uh, my discussions with the President uh, on whatever fa act, uh, issue it is, uh, those uh, uh, I do not go public uh, with that. I don't think that's the right, the proper thing to do so uh, our focus here today is simply to tell the American people we acknowledge the threat it is real it is continuing and we're doing everything we can to have a legitimate election that the American people can have trust in in addition to that it goes beyond the elections it goes to Russia's intent to undermine our democratic values drive a wedge between our allies and do a number of other nefarious things and we are looking at that also, but today we are here to talk about the elections coming up and what we're doing, ensuring the American people will have a legitimate... Just clarify, so because both you and Director Ray said that Russia continues to try to meddle in, in our elections they do. And, and influence voters, if, are we talking about rogue Russian individuals or are we talking about the Kremlin? I think uh, you can both and even add to that. Russia has used numerous ways in which they want to influence uh, through media, social media, through bots, through actors that they hire, through proxies, uh, all of the above and potentially more. I can't go into any deep, deep details other than what is classified, but it's pervasive, it is ongoing uh, with the intent uh, to achieve their intent, and that is drive a wedge and undermine our democratic values. Uh, thank you. I have a question for Director Ray. Um, thank you. Uh, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, has indicted more than 20 uh, Russian officials based on work uh, by the FBI for meddling in the 2016 election. Now, the president has tweeted that that uh, investigation by the special counsel is a hoax and should be shut down. I know you said that you don't believe it is a hoax, but why would the American people uh, believe what you're saying about the FBI when the president uh, says that the investigation by the special counsel is a hoax and when the press secretary yesterday said that there was a lot of corruption within the FBI? Do you have any response to those statements coming from the White House? Well, I can assure the American people that the men and women of the FBI, starting from the director all the way on down, are going to follow our oaths and do our jobs. Sarah. 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 Thanks, Sarah. I have a question for Director Director Coates. Director Coates, how would you characterize the current effort, the Russian efforts to meddle in the 2018 election relative to 2016? Is it more intense? Do you see those efforts focused on a particular party? And in general, is the pace of those operations in any way relative to 2014, 2012, or is it more intense? Relative to uh, what we have seen for the midterm elections, uh, it is not the kind of robust campaign that we assessed in the 2016 election. We know that through decades Russia has tried to use its propaganda and methods to uh, sow discord uh, in America. However, they stepped up their game big time in 2016. We have not seen that kind of robust effort from them so far. Uh, as I mentioned uh, publicly uh, sometime just a few weeks ago we're only one keyboard click away from finding out something that we don't haven't seen up to this particular point in time but right now we have not seen that to follow up sir uh, to follow up sir do, do you see it directed to any particular party the current 2018 efforts is there any particular party that is benefiting from current 2018 russian efforts what we see is the russians are looking for every opportunity regardless of party regardless of of uh, uh, whether or not it, it applies to the election uh, to continue their pervasive efforts to undermine our fun fundamental values. Jeff, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Also for Director Coates, in the run-up to the I'll House try to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps Ambassador Bolton can weigh in on this as well. But in the, in the run-up to the Helsinki summit, U.S. officials, uh, ambassador, ambassadors to NATO, ambassadors to Russia said that the president would raise the issue of a malign activity with President Putin. But he didn't discuss that, at least at the press conference. You're saying today that the president has directed you to make the issue of election meddling a priority. How do you explain the disconnect between what you are saying, his advisors, and what the president has said about this issue? 
I'm not in a position to either understand fully or uh, talk about what happened at Helsinki. I'll turn it over to the National Security Director here uh, to, to address that question. Yeah, the, uh, the issue was discussed, and in fact, President Putin said, uh, I thought at the press conference, but certainly in the expanded bilateral meeting when uh, the two leaders got together with their, their senior advisors, President Putin said the first issue that President Trump raised was election meddling. I guess the question is, um, at the press conference, the President didn't highlight any of the malign activities that you have and that his advisors have. And so, should Americans believe that he is listening to you, your advice or that he is going his own way when he's having meetings like he did with the President of Russia? I think the President has made it abundantly clear to everybody who has responsibility in this area that he cares deeply about it and that he expects them to do their jobs to their fullest ability and that he supports them fully. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I believe this is either for Director Coates or Director Ray. I'll, I'll let either of you choose. Um, since social media was brought up, there is a recent case with Facebook, how they had just shut down um, some 32 accounts believed potentially to be from Russia. Can you give us an idea? Is that a large amount? Is that a just kind of the tip of the iceberg? And then generally speaking, with these social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, how much have they progressed or have they not progressed in what you would like to see in terms of progression from 2016 and identifying the threat? So first, I'm not going to discuss any specific ongoing investigation, uh, but what I will tell you is that activity of the sort you're describing is a good reflection of the fact that we have to have a public-private partnership in this particular threat. And that's why when I talked about our three pillars of the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force, we're spending so much of our effort trying to engage with the social media and technology companies because there is a very important role for them to play in terms of monitoring and in effect policing their own platforms. So what we have to have happen, which has started happening in a way that's much more robust, much more robust than in before the 2016 election, we're sharing with them actionable intelligence in a way that wasn't happening before. We understand better what they need. They're sharing information back with us based on what they find. There are things that they can do on their platforms voluntarily in terms of terms of use and things like that that the government doesn't have a role in. But in turn, we learn things from them, and we can use that to have our investigations be more effective. So I do think progress is being made. We've got to keep getting better at it. We've got to keep staying on the balls of our feet. But I think that's what we're seeing. Sarah, 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 um, Ambassador Bolton, in your letter you talk about ordering the closure of the consulates in San Francisco and Seattle. These are two tech hubs. What happened there that led you to do that? Well, I'm not going to discuss the background of that decision, uh, which actually occurred before I, I came to this job, but the purpose of uh, expelling the Russian uh, individuals uh, that, that were expelled was to send a signal to Russia that their conduct in uh, conducting a chemical weapons attack in Great Britain was unacceptable, uh, and this was a mode of retaliation designed to show that we uh, will not tolerate that kind of activity on the territory of uh, the United States or any of our allies. And we expelled a lot of the people who uh, we think had knowledge of it or had other activities in the United States that we considered unacceptable. Um, this, I guess, would be for maybe the Sec Secretary Nielsen or, or Mr. Ray. Um, the, these meddling campaigns seem to fall into two broad categories, the sort of information campaigns, which challenge the information upon which Americans use to make their determinations, and then the more physical uh, interferences into the machinery of voting, the tabulation of voting, the voter rolls, the, the machinery that, that the states run. Um, can you guys describe what you're seeing specifically in the run-up to this coming election? In both of those areas, do you, do you worry more about one than the other? Do you have, are there specific threats that maybe you can't even talk about, but that you can say there are, have been specific threats in both of those categories? So that, and, and how, should, how should Americans process that where we're going to go to the polls in a few months? Um, do, should people be confident that when they pull the lever, they're, they're secure? Well, I think, I think we've said this fairly consistently, that in the context of 2018, uh, we are not yet seeing the same kind of efforts to specifically target 
election infrastructure, uh, you know, voter registration databases in particular. What we are seeing are the malign influence operations, in effect, information warfare that we've talked about, and that didn't really, that's a 24-7, 365 days a year phenomenon that doesn't turn necessarily on whether or not we're in the middle of an election season or not. Uh, but, as Director Coates said, any, any moment is just a moment before, you know, the, the dial can be turned up one, uh, much as we saw in 2016. Again, not in terms of affecting the vote count, but in terms of potential penetration of voter registration databases or something like that. And that, in turn, can be a vehicle for them to try to sow discord or undermine confidence. And we have to make sure we're pushing back on it, which is what we're doing. Sir. Yeah, so just so just to add, so the way that we're splitting it, we're all partnering together, but uh, your question just shows a little bit of the division of labor. So DHS is focused on the election infrastructure in support of state and locals that have the primary responsibility, and then we support the FBI's efforts in countering foreign influence. But with respect to the infrastructure piece, we have seen a willingness and a capability uh, on the part of the Russians, and so we are working very closely with state and locals to ensure that we're prepared this time round. Part of that is encouraging states to have auditability. So to get to that one part of your question, whatever happens, we want to assure Americans the day after that their vote was counted and it was counted correctly. So regardless of what might happen, we will be prepared, but we also want to make sure we have that auditability. Secretary Nielsen, would a government shut down on October 1st affect any of these efforts? Uh, election. So uh, what we have done, as you know, is in uh, 2017, uh, DHS designated election infrastructure a critical infrastructure subsector. So we prioritize efforts. Uh, so any state that requests a vulnerability assessment, a hunt team, uh, best practices, hygiene scans, et cetera, we will continue to prioritize uh, within our budget. So thank you. We'll take one last question. Sarah, 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 this is for the director and for the general. Um, can you... Uh, unpack a little bit more about what you said there. You said there was um, a question for the director and a question for the general separately. Um, can you give us a better sense of who specifically has been targeted? We know at least two senators have said that they've been uh, targeted uh, by hacking or by people impersonating government officials. Is it members of the Senate, members of the House? Is it Democratic and Republican campaigns? Uh, and then a separate question for the general. Uh, we follow a procedure that's been agreed on uh, some time ago in terms of uh, when we uh, receive this type of information it is processed uh, through the leadership uh, of the respective house or uh, chamber uh, senate chamber uh, and then disseminated down to the uh, individual member who was who was targeted uh, so we have taken that action that is in place but i'm not in a position right now to uh, release those names and would you support legislation imposing sanctions on Russia now that you're saying they have in fact interfered or attempted Well, we already have those, some of the, a lot of sanctions in place and I, I would support any efforts that we can collectively um, put together to send the signal to Russia that there is a cost to, uh, price to pay for what they're doing and if we want to have any kind of relationship whatsoever in dealing with things of mutual interest uh, the Russians have to stop doing what they're doing or it's simply not going to happen. And General, have Does you been, General, have you been um, ordered uh, at all to or authorized to conduct any offensive cyber operations in response to this? So my uh, guidance and the direction from the President, Secretary of Defense is very clear. We're not going to accept uh, meddling in the elections and it's very unambiguous. Will there be so additional right. sanctions for the 13 Russians that were indicted? So Sarah, we'll Sarah, thank you all very much. We really appreciate you being here today. We'll take a couple more questions on other topics uh, today. Jill, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about the president's tweet on North Korea. He was addressing Kim Jong-un. He said, quote, I look forward to seeing you soon. Um, are there plans in place right now, any discussion about a second meeting? And also, um, he said he received a letter um, from Kim. Um, what did the letter say, and did it address any of the reports um, that appear to show that Kim is not actually working towards denuclearization? De de uh, that's a lot of questions rolled into one. I'll try to address each one, and if I miss something, I'm sure uh, you guys will point it out. Uh, he did receive a letter. I believe he received it on August 1st. Uh, there is not a second meeting that is currently 
currently uh, locked in or finalized, uh, certainly open to that discussion, but there isn't a meeting planned. Um, we have responded to Chairman Kim's letter, the President has, uh, and that letter will be delivered shortly. Beyond that, I can't get into any further details. Sure. Right. Letter the concerns of potentially building I can say space. that uh, the letters addressed their commitment uh, from their joint statement and that was made at the Singapore summit and they're going to continue working together uh, towards complete and total denuclearization. Sure. Uh, again, I can't go any further than what I just told you. Ivanka right uh, Trump made two statements this morning at odds with the positions of her father. She said the media are not the enemy of the people and also called family separation at the border a low point. But what does the president think of those statements? Uh, certainly the, the president himself has stated that he doesn't like the idea of family separation. I don't think anybody does. We also don't like the idea of open borders. We don't like the idea of allowing people into our country if we don't know who they are, where they're going, and why they're coming. The president wants to secure our borders, which is why he has asked Congress to fix the law. Uh, we haven't been unclear about what our position is here. We want to secure the borders. We want to change the law. It's Congress's job to do that. We'd like them, particularly Democrats, to stop playing political games and step up and do their jobs. And on the press, do you any of the people or not? The president's rightfully frustrated. Ninety percent of the coverage uh, on him is negative, despite the fact that the economy is booming, ISIS is on the run, and American leadership is being reasserted around the world. Just this week, the media refused to cover his remarks in Florida highlighting efforts on workforce development. In fact, the pooler for the press said that there was no news made, despite the fact that the governor of the state joined with dozens of businesses across the state of Florida to announce thousands of new jobs. That may not be news in Washington, D.C., but I can assure you that it's news in the state of Florida that people that didn't have a job before this president took office have better opportunity and the opportunity to have a job moving forward. That's actually real news and something that people in the state of Florida and across this country appreciate and that was totally ignored. Not only that, before uh, a journalist on CNN claimed that the president hadn't taken questions in over a week, despite the fact that same journalist did a live shot from the two and two uh, press conference that the president had with the Prime Minister of Italy just moments after making that accusation. With this sort of misinformation and lack of interest uh, that's so pervasive in the media, it's completely <laughs> understandable for the president to be frustrated. John Decker. Sorry, John Decker, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Sarah. I wanted to ask you about the conference call that uh, took place yesterday involving uh, U.S.-China trade relations. Is there a, a timeline as to when or if the uh, president may pull the trigger and impose harsher sanctions on China, harsher tariffs on China? Uh, we're continuing to monitor that uh, process, and when we have an announcement on that, we'll certainly let you know. Sarah, is the goal at the end of the Sorry. day, I'm really quickly, is the goal at the end of the day to get China back to the negotiating table the way they were at the negotiating table with American uh, trade officials just a few months ago? The goal at the end of the day is to end the unfair trade practices that China is engaged in for decades and that the administrations before this president have ignored. Okay. Jonathan. Uh, returning to the question of, of election security, the, the president has said other people also may have been involved in the uh, efforts to interfere with the 2016 election. Did any of the people that we saw up here, has there been any evidence uh, from the intelligence community that there were others besides Russia that were involved in election meddling? Uh, certainly we know there are others, and we know that um, there are others that are considering uh, making attempts in 2018, which is what our focus is uh, moving forward. As you know, none of us were here in 2016, but we're here now, uh, and the individuals that were standing up here just moments ago, the focus and the full weight of the government uh, asked by the president and directed by the president is to protect the election infrastructure in 2018 and moving forward, and that's exactly what we're going to do. But who, 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 who are the others that were involved in, in, in I, I, the I, I can't get into specific details, but our intelligence shows that there are a number of others that uh, are looking at and considering engaging, particularly in 2018. And, and he also said that they're trying to help Democrats. He suggested that the, that the Russians would be trying to help Democrats in the midterm elections. Has there been any evidence whatsoever that Democrats are the, the Russians are trying to help Democrats in 2020. Well, I, I think you can see um, just from what took place over uh, in the, the Facebook, I know Director Ray wasn't at liberty to speak about the specifics, and I can't get into a lot of them, but I can tell you that a number of them uh, were anti-President uh, Trump, and that certainly isn't helping Republicans. John. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. 
Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I did. I called you before. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. I, I wanted you to, to respond, if you could, to the CAFE standards rule that was proposed by the administration today. Uh, the 20 states' attorney general that have already said that they will sue this administration. This is part of their complaint. They say freezing or weakening these standards put the health of our children, seniors, and communities at risk. It also increases the rising cost of climate change for our states. The administration's response would be what? Uh, that the reporting that we're reversing Obama-era fuel efficiency standards and preempting the tougher California standards is simply false. What the EPA released yesterday was a notice of proposed rulemaking, not a final rule. The notice lays out a series of options for how to go forward with CAFE standards, and the notice asks for comments on the range of options. We're simply opening it up for a comment period, and we'll make a final decision at the end of that. From 10 to 25 percent. I'm sorry? On the move on, on terrorists potentially from 10 to 25 percent. What was the thing that made the president say this is why, why I want to do it? Uh, again, the president's been clear. He's going to hold China's feet to the fire, and he wants uh, to stop the unfair trade practices. Sarah, right there. Emerald, hey, Sarah, since Sarah, you attacked our news organization, Emerald, go can, ahead. I a, can I get a question from Sorry, you? I'll come to you next, Jim. Okay, Emerald, go you. ahead. Going back to election security, the other night in Tampa, the president mentioned voter IDs. Uh, for elections. Going forward with election security, is the administration looking at proposing a voter ID law or ID law or pushing a voter ID law? I, I'm sorry, what was the last part of your question? There's a lot of feedback, so I'm sorry. having a hard time hearing in the is back. Is the administration, as part of this, of this election security push, also looking to do a voter ID law to try to push something like that through Congress? Look, we're looking to do everything we can at this point to protect the 2018 elections, uh, the integrity of those elections, and moving on beyond 2018 to 2020 and after. Uh, we haven't made a final decision, but certainly looking at every option available to us. It's not unreasonable. Uh, if I return something to a department store, if I have to cash a check. I have to show my ID in order to do those things. It's not outrageous that if you're going to vote to decide on who the leaders of the local communities, your state and the federal government are going to be, that you would be asked to show an ID. Jim? I just wanted to follow up on, uh, on Sarah's question from NPR. She asked you about Ivanka Trump's statement that the press is not the enemy of the people. And she asked you whether or not the press is the enemy of the people. You read off a laundry list of your concerns about the press and, and things that you feel like are misreported, but you did not say that the press is not the enemy of the people. And I, I, I think it would be a good thing if you were to say right here uh, at this briefing that the press, the people who are gathered in this room right now, uh, doing their jobs every day, asking questions of officials like the ones you brought forward earlier, are not the enemy of the people. I, I, I think we we deserve that. I think the president has made his position known. I also think it's you ironic. Telling us, I'm, I'm Sarah, trying to answer you your question. Okay, I, well, I politely waited and I even called on you despite the fact that you interrupted me while calling on your colleague. Well, you I said it's ironic. Which is why yes. I interrupted. I'm trying. But if you, if you finish, if you would not mind letting me have a follow-up, that would be fine. But it's ironic. Jim, uh, that not only you and the media attack the president for his rhetoric uh, when they frequently lower the level of conversation in this country. Repeatedly, repeatedly, the media resorts to personal attacks without any content other than to incite anger. Uh, the media has attacked me personally on a number of occasions, including your own network, said I should be harassed as a life sentence, that I should be choked. ICE officials are not welcomed in their place of worship and personal information is shared on the Internet. When I was hosted by the Correspondents Association, of which almost all of you are members of, you brought a comedian up to attack my appearance and call me a traitor to my own gender. In fact, as I know, um, I'm, as far as I know, I'm the first press secretary in the history of the United States that's required secret service protection. No, the media the continues to ratchet Netflix. up the Why verbal assault the against yeah. the president and everyone in this administration. And certainly we have a role to play, but the media has a role to play for the discourse in this country as well. And, and sir, if you don't mind, if I, if, wait, hold on, if I may follow up, if I may follow up, excuse me, you did not say in the course of those remarks that you just made that the press is not the enemy of the people. Are we to take it from what you just said? We all get put through the ringer. We all get put in the meat grinder in this town, and you're no exception. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. I wish that that, that had not happened. But for, for the sake of this, this room, the people who are in this room, this democracy, this country, 
All the people around the world are watching what you're saying, Sarah, and the White House for the United States of America, the President of the United States should not refer to us as the enemy of the people. His own daughter acknowledges that, and all I'm asking you to do, Sarah, is to acknowledge that right now and right here. I, I appreciate your passion. I share it. Um, I've addressed this question. I've addressed my personal feelings. I'm here to speak on behalf of the President. He's made his comments clear. Sarah, so on, a, on another matter, um, the National Archives told the Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman today that they probably aren't going to be able to finish up the document collection regarding Brent Kavanaugh until October. That's obviously later than the timetable I know you guys and Senate Republicans are hoping for. Any comment on that or any potential assistance that the White House can give the archives in accelerating that? Uh, certainly we want to be as helpful as possible in turning over as many documents. Uh, several senators have stated there will be up to uh, and over a million pages of documents to review, including over 300 judicial opinions. His documents as staff secretary tell us the least about his judicial thinking than the million pages from his other work, including his judicial opinions. We want a thorough evaluation. We've asked for that, but we don't want a taxpayer-funded fishing expedition. We want to continue to be cooperative, and that's exactly what we're going to do. I'll take a last question, Jordan. One more for the right side. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I want to follow up on the third part of Jill's question from earlier on North Korea. Uh, we're nearing now the two-month mark from the Singapore summit. So is the president satisfied with the progress North Korea is making toward denuclearization? The president won't be completely satisfied until all of uh, Korea has been denuclearized. We're going to continue moving forward. Uh, we've seen steps of progress uh, and continued cooperation. Uh, we're incredibly grateful and thankful uh, for the remains of the service members that were returned yesterday. Um, and we're going to continue to work with North Korea. I think that's a great place to close out. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good day.